the business. Welcome back, welcome back to another episode, another installment of Day One Radio, right here on ablradio.com. That's Art Beats and Lyrics Radio to be exact. Make sure you download the very free, very accessible smartphone app for your iPhone and Android devices. And also make sure you check out the entire Day One Radio catalog at dayoneradio.com, as well as in the iTunes podcast section. My name is Maurice Garland. I'm one of your gracious co-hosts, and to my right I have... Brandon LSK, the world-famous BP. What's going on, brother? I'm chilling, man. You know, happy uh, Black History Month to you, man. (laughs) Exactly, for sure, for sure, man. And me and and Reese have been chopping it up uh, over probably over the last few months about talking to to people that have black-owned businesses. Right. And, and, and not just, you know, black owned businesses in your particular city, but people that can touch folks nationally and internationally. And one of our homeboys, man, started a, a brand. I think it might be almost two years now, a year and a half, two years, uh, called Triple OG. And y'all have probably seen it on different, you know, celebrities and people online or whatever. But we want to, you know, bring him in and chop it up, man. The homeboy Lotto. Owner and, and proprietor of a uh, Triple OG brand. What's good, bro? Man, what's happening, man? I'm glad to be here. You know what I'm saying? Appreciate you boys for having me down. For sure, for sure. Good to have you, man. So tell people who don't know, what what does the whole Triple OG stand for? Because I don't think, you know, for us growing up where we grew up, you know, a Triple OG is somebody that got that 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 status in the, in the hood. That status is somebody who is... Very important that they they that ghetto card can't be revoked. Bingo, bingo, <laughs> so, bingo. You know, but I seen youngsters wearing the brand too, man. So what? It, tell me, what does the whole triple OG thing mean? Well, let me let me say this first and foremost. Like it started off as as a song that I had. You know what I mean? Yeah. And basically, in the song Triple OG, I was describing basic principles. Um, basically, I was just over the ratchet era. You know what I mean? It's just like so cool for everything to be super ratchet. You know, it's like the more ratchet it becomes, the the cooler it is. And so, you know, I just come in the game from a grown man perspective. You know what I mean? So, um, once I made the song, the guy who mixed it, he sent it back to me. He sent the extra mix, and it was titled O O O G. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. You know what I mean? Like, I should make some shirts to promote the song. Right. But the shirt started to move more than the music. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yo, this is crazy. So anyway, you know, I, I, I got on a, uh, invited on a trip to do uh, the Revolt Music Conference. And down there, they like, yo, you got a clothing line. It's a brand. It's a brand. And I'm like, these just T-shirts. No, it's a brand. I'm like, bet it's a brand. So then I just started going hard, pushing it. So the whole time, you know what I mean? I felt like God was speaking to me, you know what I mean? Telling me like, this is your purpose. This is why I'm giving this to you. This is what you're supposed to be bringing across with this. And so I really started to look into it and take it serious. So what, what, what you're supposed to do biblically, and, and, and it's not like a religious brand, but I just go according to those laws. What you're supposed to do is take what's meant for a bad thing and turn it good. So I know like a lot of our uh, elders would be like, man, what are you talking to? I'm a triple OG, but this dude don't work the regular job all his life. He might yeah. be a triple OG in coaching. He yeah. might, that means he tenured. He's, he's been through it. So I came up with a menu for this, and um, I want everybody to hear this and hear this clear. It says a triple OG is wisdom acquired through life experience, struggle, endurance, and setbacks. A triple OG has stayed the course through all its ups and downs, never giving up on his or her dreams, passions, or goals. A triple OG is one that is a shining example to those ahead of them, beside them, and the ones to come. Three times great, three times a genius, three times grand. To be labeled as a triple OG means you've earned the respect to represent the triple OG brand. So basically, that's what we're about. This dance ain't for everybody, <laughs> only the sexy people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what so why do you think so many people have you know taken to the shirts? Because I mean, I remember like when you put them out, and I remember them being a promo item for the song. You right. Know what I'm then it's like right. I saw everybody with the shirts. So like, why do you think everybody has like taken to these shirts so fast, man? I don't know, man. I mean, I mean, I do know, but you know what I mean. I just feel like 
when people see that, like right away, they attracted to it. You know, for the older folks, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a triple OG. I relate to that. And then the young folks, like, I want to be, you know, they want to be a triple OG. They want to be considered that. Yeah, I wear that. And they wear it as a badge. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, you know, me, when I look at the, the logo, because I've asked myself the same thing, and it seems like the logo reflecting, when you look at it, it says good. You know what I mean? And, gotcha. and what is so catchy about seeing that good? It's just a good energy. You know what I'm saying? So so what I try to do with, 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 with all the clothing is just make sure that I don't miss. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's something you're going to want to wear. I make sure those colors lock up so right. that when you see that logo jump off, you're going to be attracted to it. You know what I mean? Right. Now, have you got any, has, has the, the, the auto company sweated you at all? No, not at all. Logo? That's not good. Not at all. Not at all. I got the best um, uh, IP attorney in the state of Georgia, bro. Though. We good. That's you know oh yeah, I, I seen the pictures. When, like I, I saw when the lawyer meeting started coming around. I was like, all right, all right he, he, he's on top of this, you know. <laughs> but you know what's crazy? And for people who are not in fashion or in trademark, what is IP? Uh, intellectual property. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha, okay. gotcha. yeah. So basically, you go to them and you trademark your brand. Got gotcha. you. You know what I mean? So, and when you go through the process, they got to make sure that you're not sharing. Like, you, yours may look similar to something, but you can't be having the same likeness. Like, like for instance, um, if, 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 if this brand over here is an auto brand and, and they selling cars out of a place, I can't be similar and be selling cars, too. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. I got to be selling, you know, clothing, doing something totally different so that the consumer is not confused. Got you. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, man, what is, I mean, obviously the people that you've had relationships with from athletes, actors, you know, rappers, the whole thing of wearing the brand. But what has been the craziest or like most out the box request that you've gotten from somebody like, how you know about this? Man, Steve LaBelle. Wow. Steve LaBelle. So this is before I even got the trademark. It was just triple OG. Now, for people who do, who don't know who that is, inform them. All right. So Steve LaBelle is like, man, like a guru in the music game. So yeah. I've known him for from, from managing like Bone Thugs and Harmony. You know what I mean? Groups of that magnitude. Now he has like a consultant businesses, a consultant business where he just uh, consults all the top entertainers on how to grow their brands and uh, mainly in the music industry. Yeah. Okay. He's but, a heavyweight. Uh, for Google sure. that yeah. guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's been around a long time. Anyway. I get an email from him. This before the Miami thing and all of that. This is before the Revolt Music Comedy. This I only been in business for about a month. And I wouldn't even call it business. I'm still selling t-shirts at this point. Right. So he sent a message to my email. Not Triple OG email, not Street Lotto email, Keith Smith email. Gotcha. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't nobody call me that, but, you know, child support or something. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> it's like, you know, like, how did he get this one? Right. So he's like, yo, I've been checking out the brand. You know, we usually charge people, but, yo, we really like the brand. Send something to me and my man. And I was just blown away because I was like, how do he know me? How do he know about the brand? Right. And then that's when I realized that it was something real because he was hitting me up yeah. on my personal email. You know what I'm saying? So that's the wildest thing I ever that's seen. That's crazy. That's dope. But um, so, man, what? obviously you, you've expanded beyond just T-shirts yeah. at this point. Like we've seen hats, we've seen hoodies, everything. Like what's your plans for the brand like in the long term? Well, my plan is, you know, I've always been told, you know what I mean, just to ride the wave. You know what I mean? When you catch a wave, ride it. And um, so daily, I'm just coming up with new things to do all the time. So my goal is just to keep touching more people. That's what I always wanted to do with the music. When I was doing music, I want to touch as many people as I can touch. I think uh, music limited me to touch more people because when I'm giving a brand and I'm running a brand, so I got... Young black teenagers, male, female, old white ladies, white family, Chinese family, Hispanic guy, from all different walks of life. So my goal is to be, you know, uh, kind of like Levi's. No matter what, Levi's got something for you. Yeah. No, no matter you a thug, skater, old guy, whatever, they got something for you. And that's what I want. That's what I strive to be. So like right now, you know. 
T-shirts, hoodies. Now we get the long sleeves, sweatshirts, tank tops. Um, I, I, I just started a line of dry fit. Yeah, you know you what I mean? telling me about yeah, that. Yeah, dry fit because it's like this is the season. You know, everybody want to get in shape. They want to look good doing it. And I want to supply that demand. You know what I mean? So anything to promote uh, positivity and, and and promote the lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? It's a lifestyle associated with this. Like if you pay attention, you see a certain type of person wearing this. You know what I mean? And that's that's the energy we want to project. And I feel like we're doing it through the clothing, through the brand, through the association, through the people that are wearing it and stuff like that. Cool, cool, cool. And, and, and talk about, you know... I don't know if like gracious is the word, but I mean, like, people are actually buying it. I, mean, I, I can imagine the folks are like, hey, bro, I know you since, you know what I'm saying? Distant replay, bro. You know what I'm saying? You can go ahead and hook me up. You know what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> right. right. But I, I remember that you gave me one. I was like, well, nah, I need to buy one too. Like right. today. Like you, you going to give me one. I'm going to buy one too. So like just talk about, you know, like how grace you, gracious you are for people actually supporting it more so than like, Hey, bro, I mean, you shoot me like three for 20. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, I get some of that, too. You know what I'm saying? I get that, too, because uh, you know what's crazy? I move most of my product through Facebook. Hmm. Not my website, not Instagram, Facebook. Now, what is Facebook, though? Instagram is blah, blah, land. You know, you can create any <laughs> fantasy over there. Facebook is the people that know you. Like, bro, come on. I know you, bro. Don't, you know, you street like I know you. You know what I'm saying? Right. So what happens is this. When, when when we started it, so I had uh, Kenny Burns. Kenny Burns put it on award. And I was like, yo, Kenny Burns award is real. So my designer, the guy who do all the designs with my man, Stacey Lake, Stacey Woods, he said, look, man, that's cool that, that you letting those guys wear them celebrity like, but a lot of people on your timeline they rock with you, dog. Post them wearing your stuff on your social media. I'm like, bet. And since I did that, it spread like must. I got people now that just buy it and just be like, hold on. They'll put it on like, Let, let's take a picture. You know what I'm saying? Like that. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So a lot of people just want to support the brand. So they might come up to me with money like, man, I want to buy whatever you got. Man, I, well, I got this color. Man, it don't matter what color, man. Here. You know what I'm saying? I just want to buy. I just want to support. So I'm, I'm, I'm humble and I'm blown away by that. And I still get the, you know what I mean, dog? You know what I'm saying? I don't bought four. <laughs> Shall be like, come on, throw me one or two, man. For my, and, and, but I'm going to do that too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because to me, it's about the look. I make everyday stuff because, say I give you a hoodie. You know, you buy a hoodie. Chances are, depending on the way you run your life, you might wear that hoodie two, three times that week. Not as like a fashion statement. You might throw it on, go to the store, throw it right. on a run down here, throw it on run, but you keep throwing it on. So I'm getting that look every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I make clothes like that so that it's, it's every day where like if you make, make something super expensive, like the more expensive it is, we really ain't going to wear it. Right, right. We're wear it once. A couple months <laughs> and, later, and, and, like, then, and don't let anybody take a picture of you in it. It's over. You, you got to retire. It's <laughs> over. Man. Like, I can't even wear that no more. Right. You know what I'm saying? Dog, I mean, you know, I just, I mean, this done got that real. I remember at the time, I used to spend like $100 on a polo, right? I wear it. I snap it up so many times that I'm like, man, this shirt dead to me, dog. What am I going to do with this? This nigga look like Charlie Brown. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm out of $100, and I really can't wear it because this picture is all over Facebook. Right. So it's just like, you know, I, and, and, I, and I try to keep everything at an affordable rate, too. You know what I mean? Just, I, all I do is think Levi's, Levi's, Levi's. What is it? You know what I'm saying? Right. And move like that. You know what I'm saying? That's dope, man. So, and, you know, we know you. So yeah. I got to ask you this. Who, who you got in the Super Bowl this weekend? I'm going to rock with Cam. I think that's what the general consensus is. <laughs> yeah, man, you got to rock with Cam, man. You got to. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Peyton Manning. I love what he's done, you know, the whole nine yards, man. But at the same time, I just want somebody. He To me, he represent hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you got a certain affinity for somebody who truly represent that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm always going to be partial to that. And I, and, I, and I think it's amazing what they did, right? One loss the whole year. Right. Come on, man. You got to give it up. You know what I mean? And they don't want to give him his. That's what make you want to root for him even more. Right. Right. I yeah. just hope it ain't no shenanigans like it was in the Super Bowl last year. Oh, uh, right. Right. You know, right. That'll be crazy. Right. But, yo, please tell us and, and the people that are listening where they can purchase your products and where they can follow you to see what's next and all of that. Uh, so, 
You can go to www.oogbrand.com. Um, that's where you can purchase from the site. You can also hit me up on Instagram at Street Lotto or at OOOG Brand. Uh, you can hit me up on Facebook as well. Um, Street Lotto um, is my personal page where really I get most of the action. I don't know why. And then um, my um, business page is OOOG Brand, B R A N D. Uh, you can hit me up and get in touch with me that way and just, you know, continue to uh, support the movement and uh, talk to me. I talk back, you know what I'm saying? I'm personable. I learned one thing uh, from, um, you remember when I used to work at Distant Replay? Yeah. And so, you know, Andy, when I worked for Andy, Andy knew everybody that came through that door by name. And, and for those who don't know, Distant Replays was like, other than the Mitchell and Ness store in Philly, Distant Replays was like the throwback store when throwback jerseys was popping, like in the country. Right. Like, period. Right. And and basically, that's where I met you. Yeah. No so I met everybody there. But Andy knew everybody that walked through that door, first and last name, or he had asked you about your kids. And I thought that was tremendous. Like all these people to come through and he knows his customers. So I think that's why I do more business through Facebook because I go out of my way to be personable. You know what I mean? Like you can go to my site, but I also want you to know me because I mean, to be honest with you, Triple OG brand is my life story. Um, you guys know me from way back right. and, and hell, at least 14 years, something yeah. like yeah. It, it's been a long time. You know what I mean? And, and I will say this to anybody listening. Um, Always pay attention to your relationships. It ain't like now where, you know, social media and you get to know people online. No, like I had to go out and garner all these relationships. Like I done hung out with brothers at their house, helped them move, yeah. know their families mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I know a lot of people like that. And I think that's what's really helping the movement is that people know that we've been out here pushing this line for a long time. And uh, it's just all coming together. So it's like stick with it and, and, and don't burn your bridges because you can't repaint a burnt bridge. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Yo, man, I'm proud of you, bro. Thanks for coming through, man. man. And uh, we're about to go to a quick break, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Day One Radio on ABLRadio.com. Yeah. What up, world? It's Rich Medina. You are now in tune to Day One Radio. Bang. Welcome back to Day One Radio. Appreciate the homie Lotto coming through with the Triple OG brand. And we're keeping this uh, this Black History Month thing going, yeah, man. man. Our, our listeners in the Ukraine and Lithuania and stuff, y'all just going to have to get with it this <laughs> month. It's super black this month. <laughs> but, man, we have the, the, the woman who wrote the book. On African American history, literally. For real. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Another one of our folks, Rhonda Penrice. Or when you're an author, do you go by your full yeah, name? Rhonda Rache Penrice. It's you like know, I got to do the a pimp thing. name slip back, <laughs> a, a tribe called Quest. You say the whole thing. Okay, my, my bad sister. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, you everybody's seen the Four Dummy series. It's probably the second biggest series behind the, the, the soup ones. <laughs> Uh, for the most, what was it? What was it? Something Chicken noodle for the soul. Chicken soup for the soul. Yeah. 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 Another long title. Um, African American history for dummies. The, it sounds offensive, but it's not. No, it's, it's not. It's teach. How did that whole thing come about? Like of all the people in the world, how did you end up writing this book? Well, like your boy Lado was saying, it's about keeping good relationships. When I was younger in New York, I used to work at this. Um, I used to work for the Quarterly Black Review of Books. Okay. And the woman there, Tanya Bolden, who is my editor and my mentor, she's, you guys really need to check her out because okay. she writes um, children and young adult books that are black history books. And they had, they were trying to do this book for a long time. And they reached out to her and she's done like 30 books. She couldn't do it and she recommended me. That's dope. That's super dope. So when you got the uh, the call, and mind you, the book is on Amazon. The book's been out for what? How long? Oh, a long time now. What is we like? We like oh seven. Those stars oh, are still eight, there eight. on Amazon though, so that must mean it's still selling. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> But uh, what, was it like a, I mean, obviously, if, if you guys have ever seen Rondo on TV or read any of her works, she's a very accomplished journalist. You know that she's a very intelligent person. So for you, was it like a, all right, I'm ready to do this? Or was it like a, this is kind of a daunting task? Oh, no, it was, I mean, it was daunting, of course. But for me, I've always gone hard for black history. And I think that, you know, it's something that we all should know. You know, it's not, you know, we are an integral part of American history. And it really is criminal 
that we don't learn these things. Most definitely. Now, when, when you're writing this book, like, how are you determining, like, what goes in where, what doesn't need to be in there? Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, growing up, we hear the words black history, black history. And, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's usually like five people. You know, okay, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, Barack Obama now. Yeah. Well, uh, if you live in Texas, slavery is not in there no more. No. But, uh <laughs> Well, the thing is, I did benefit from them kind of having an outline, but I, you know, as you guys know, like, you know, I've worked doing popular culture, so I've been an editor of the hip hop magazine, I write about music and stuff, and so, like, a lot of the things that they, I was like, no, this is boring, (laughs) you know, (laughs) or like, you know, like, they wanted to do, I know one of them wanted to do a whole chapter on legal cases, I'm like, I don't think so, Mm -hmm. you know, and so there were... Like with my titles, like I got my Civil War title was bringing down the house, you know, Gotcha. marching towards civil war and freedom. So like, you know, I try to bring a lot of that kind of stuff. But for me, like even on the even though it says from slavery, to civil rights movement and beyond, it actually starts in Africa, pre-transatlantic slave trade. But in the areas that are relevant to what would become the United States of America. So at first it was like, you know, like at first I was doing global stuff. So I was going to put every black person that ever did anything. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, what was our cousin name that invented the top for the peanut butter in 1873? <laughs> oh, y'all, did you see the thing like on um, Facebook? Somebody put like these PBS facts and they had like how the whole process of inoculation is from an African, yeah. you know? So it's just like we, like people really want to downplay, like even um, when it comes to how people talk about slavery, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a travesty to me that a lot of us see our ancestors the way those people see them as only being property when at the end of the day we were master horticulturalists. You know, you're not talking about people who came and mastered a language that wasn't even theirs. You're right. talking about people who were so determined to be free that this legal system ain't even theirs. Like, you had people at one time before they started equating, you know, slavery with skin color. And at first they were like, oh, if you're a Christian, you're free. And then as we started becoming, some of us started becoming Christians over here, we started suing. Hello, I'm a Christian now. You can't enslave me, you know? Exactly, exactly. And it's, I mean, that's amazing to just people that don't know that. It's amazing to me that there are still people in 2016 that believe that the first time that African people set foot in on this continent was during slavery. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. I just did a piece for the GRIO. Um, well, I did a few uh, months ago around Columbus Day. And so at first it was going to be like, you know, black explorers you should know. But as I started doing the research, and I mean, I know you guys, Ivan Van Sernerman, you know, people right. have been talking about this for years. But what was interesting is um, to find a Harvard professor who was born in Russia, was Jewish, somehow ended up in Kansas, ended up talk, um, ended up teaching in Harvard, but was a a linguist. I mean, uh, he like was a master of languages and so forth. So he wrote a book in like 1925, based on what was in Columbus's journal, saying that the language, like Africans, had to be here because yeah. the words in, which were used. Were, there was no way these words were not introduced. These words had already been there, you know? Most definitely. I mean, you can look at just in what we call Mexico now, what we call South America now. Like, right. dude, don't know Mexicans and South Americans look like them statues look? <laughs> it's like, it's, like it's fairly obvious. But, you know, a lot of times people like to ignore common sense. Yeah. But we're talking about the whole slavery thing, and Rhonda also writes a lot about movies. What do you think of the, uh, the, all the uh, hype over the birth of a nation thing? Oh, well, I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I don't like the fact that people characterize it as some people have said, oh, another slave movie. No, it's a rebellion movie. Right, right. It's, I, it's I was, a totally different thing. I was confused, by the way. I wasn't confused. I mean, when, I, when you consider the sources the source, or the right. people that are saying, that's like, okay, so they must not know who Nat Turner is. They're just seeing some images and they see the word slave. And like, oh, another slave movie. It's like, damn, y'all did not read anything outside of what they gave y'all in school. 
you know. Oh. <laughs> well, it's always interesting to me that all of a sudden when you make one movie, all of a sudden there's a whole genre. Like somebody, um, I don't, I forget. It's one of the mainstream um, publications, and they were like talking about like basically there have been these Martin Luther King movies. Uh, not I saw on the when big, you said that the other day. Yeah. <clears throat> not on the big screen, like right. Selma was the first movie to treat for Dr. King to be the star. Like there have been other movies where he comes up, but Selma is the actual first big screen film where he was the main character, the main person. Now, like in in, in writing your book, like was a lot of this a discovery process for you? Because I mean, a lot of times when you write a book, people just assume that you are an expert and the stuff just came out. Over a span of weeks, like okay, I'm just gonna sit at the computer and regurgitate everything I know because I'm the expert. Like, how much of this was a you know a discovery process for you, like learning new things? Like, oh damn, I got to put that in there now. Oh yeah, I mean, it's I mean, still I'm still learning and discovering things. Like for me, it's interesting when people go, "Ooh, I took a class in college." Well, I mean, for me, when I went to school, I went to Columbia University in New York, and I um, majored in English and history, and so I didn't actually do African American studies, but. I didn't feel like English and history excluded me. Hmm. So when I was in my history classes, like my U.S. history class, when I found out about the race riots of 1919 and there was a Chicago race riot, I'm from Chicago, I went to the library and did my own research. So I did projects when I was in college on black female missionaries to Africa. I mean, I did a lot of things. And then I worked at the Coralie Black Review of Books, where one of my jobs was to do like books worth noting. And so I would literally each issue do eight to 12 books and I would write many reviews on them. So that was like an education for me because at the time, DeCapo Press was re-releasing all these books because there is a book called The Black Phalanx that was published in like the 1890s, which talks about the participation of black you know, men mostly in all the U.S. wars, including the Civil War. So I read books like um, Duke Ellington's Music is My Mistress. I read um, Adam Clayton Powell's biography. I was exposed to, like, there's a book of um, of African-American art by Samella Lewis. You know, so it was, it's been an ongoing thing. Then I went to grad school for Southern Studies. So, you know, and then working, you know, hip-hop and even going to Columbia. I was part of a black student organization. Right. I was fortunate to make meet, you know, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. When I, was, I had professors like... Um, Charles Vernon Hamilton, who wrote Black Power with, you know, Stokely Carmichael then. I mean, I just, it's an ongoing thing. Definitely. What, um, and obviously we're in Black History Month, and you, a lot of times people, they, they, this is the time where they engross themselves <laughs> in our history, both black folks and other mm-hmm. folks, because it's in your face. Um, but it should be, you know, a year round thing, especially if you don't know. What books would you say are like the the books that people must read to learn well, about it? Well, I want to say something about when people denigrate Black History Month. Like for me, like I see Black History Month as your birthday. Okay. Hmm. You know, and I'm also fortunate enough, like, it's really weird. God Matter of fact, yeah, happy belated <coughs> birthday. Your yeah, birthday my birthday is was yesterday. Yeah. So oh, happy belated it's crazy. birthday. But, like, you know, but black is, but if you're noticing now, it kind of starts at Martin Luther King Day now. Yeah. And then, like, we're going into Women's History's Month, History Month, and in June we got Black Music Month. Like, you know, it's getting there. Like, you know, but, you know, like, but the thing that angers me, though, when people are like, why February? Because it's the shortest month. Like, this whole <laughs> idea that somebody gave us anything. Like right. we have, we have Black History Month today because Carter G. Woodson, Woodson started Negro History, History Week. Week, right? And so, like a lot of people don't know that. So this has grown out of that. And then, you know, when you talk about our history and culture, this stuff comes from the bottom up. This was Toni Morrison who went to um, Howard and then later on to Cornell. She said she'd never even heard of Negro History Week. Until she went to teach in the South. Wow. So it's a lot of things that other people take credit for. Why do you think it is that people, 
denigrate the month so much? Well, because people denigrate black people. I'm talking about us, <coughs> though. There are educated, non-self-hating black people who are like, oh, is this Black History Month? Because they don't realize. Like, the whole thing when we want to be, like, you know, put ourselves as passe and then to, like, denigrate the things that we're doing. Like, even when, I mean, like, even in pop culture, even when people are talking about, oh, like, with hip-hop, when hip-hop first came around, you know, like, when it was really game and scene, people were like, oh, this is not going to go anywhere and so forth. And now you have, this has been such a powerful force that it has created a platform for other stories to be told. Like, when I used to live in L.A. and I used to be a part of the organization of black screenwriters and stuff, and you would hear them, you know, talking negatively about hip-hop. And I was like, let's be clear. Without hip-hop, you wouldn't even have an opportunity because this has expanded our history and culture so broadly. And even whether it is from sampling the music, keeping certain songs and sounds alive. And then if you really... Like, listen to a lot of lyrics. I mean, I, I know that, you know, I'm of the generation where I learned a lot, you know, from listening to records. Oh, yeah, most <laughs> definitely. I think we all did. Like, there's, especially our generation that came up before the internet, like, a lot of us, the first time we heard who Farrakhan was, yeah. was on a public enemy record. Well, I'm from Chicago. So well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, the second or third Chicago plus she worse than me? What <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but no, nah, it's so much stuff that I went and researched, listening to PE, listening to X-Clan, listening to Cube, you know, everything. Like, you would really, and then also, hip-hop thing was very regional. So there were things I loved Goody Mob, I loved Outcast, but there were things I did not fully understand until I came to school right. down here. Oh, that's Headland and Delo. Oh, that's one sixty six. Oh, you know, that's Marta. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That you wouldn't know. Well, I can tell you one thing. When I was younger and I first was listening to um <clears throat> Salt and Pepper and I didn't like really know about the borough of Queens. Mm-hmm. And I used to think it was so dope when they were like, make no mistake, Queens is in the house. And I was like, oh, damn, that's dope. They calling themselves Queens. And all this <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know. But that's, I mean, and now everything is you got damn sites dedicated to annotating lyrics. <laughs> so, like, like, being that we're in Black History, I want to ask you this like, over the last, I want to say few, it's, always been going on like you always have corporate brands like mcdonald's doing the it's black history month we're gonna put this black person on the happy meal you know what i'm saying and put this person on the sign and then even now you, you see some cool stuff like nike and adidas doing black I history month inspired so, yeah. sneakers like like do you think corporate involvement does anything to like help the existence of the month or do you think it's more of a thing where it's like it's straight capitalism and you know pretty much like kind of like like whoring it out almost well I know it helps because when I was growing up like I mean well like um, Tom Joyner he had partnered with McDonald's to do little known black history facts and it's something like you Dude, could, that was Tom <coughs> I remember that yeah I didn't even and, know that was Tom Joyner. Yeah, Tom Joyner, like his little black and little known black history facts. And you could roll through the McDonald's drive through and scoop it for a dollar. I still got mine. So those things do have help. And for me, I guess because when I was younger, I mean, I worked in McDonald's for three summers. I worked in a black owned McDonald's in my neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think that, but the thing is, you have to, like, we have to be involved. What's happening now is in that time when corporations were kind of stepping into this, they they didn't think they knew us so well. So they had to hire us. Now we have people that are writing things, and that's why it becomes, you know, it becomes, like, exploitative because you got people who don't really know. And as you know, like, certain things... Black is like two things. <clears throat> of course, there are those of us who undeniably people look at us and go, oh, they're black. But black is also a culture. And what we don't yeah. understand is that so many things are passed down. Like, I tell people, yes, yeah, a lot of people that know different knowledge, but I had the benefit of going to a school that was predominantly black but had white and Mexicans in my school. Yep. But our culture set the tone. 
And like, you know, there are different things that you can't teach certain people because they didn't grow up in it. That doesn't mean that you can't have an appreciation for it. But it's like my brother, I have my youngest brother speaks Chinese. So he would really like he speaks Mandarin. He would really like to speak Cantonese. But Cantonese is something that you have to really grow up in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are aspects of that. That doesn't mean you can't participate in the culture, but you need to understand. Just like, you know, you know, coming from the Bay and you coming from the A, you know, we all got our different little slang. And so right. for like, you know, even watching certain shows like years ago when the series Soul Food was on the air, I just have to watch it like it's not in Chicago. Because right. we don't say movies, we say show. We don't say... Like, we don't say doll, we say doll. So, right. you know, and those things are real. But if you're not, like, when people, because of the way I talk, when people I encounter from Chicago, like, want to doubt me, then we start talking. And they're like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. You Makes know, so speaking of being involved, you know what I'm saying, like, over the last couple of weeks, you know, the whole Oscars so white thing, like, some people are on the side of things saying, yeah, the Oscars just straight up racist. And you have some folks that are actually saying, well... We need to find a way to actually like get involved in the system so that we are better represented. Like, like, where do you stand on that thing that you know you actually cover film a lot too, just as much as music, if not more? Well, I actually worked as a film publicist, so I was a film publicist. I worked on Nutty Professor to um, bring it on How High and the first Fast and the Furious. So my job as a film publicist was to do outreach to black audiences, but like. You can't be nominated when things don't exist. So even now when we're talking about, you know, like Jason Mitchell, who, you know, deserves a supporting actor slot. But you also have to look at the Oscars. You have to see what the field is, you know. So like uh, that person's probably not going to make it. Or like when people want to talk about Idris's nomination, it's like Idris probably didn't if, if they somebody felt he deserved it. You also have to look at the fact that it was a Netflix film. Mm -hmm. So now you got additional politics for that. Right. But at the end of the day, when you're talking about the black folks that could be nominated, we're not talking about more than four or five films. Now, on the side of white folks, like we're talking about, shoot, it's like 50 to 75 films that they pull in from. If not so more. you're going to have more nominations. And then, you know, we're making it into a black white thing. But at the end of the day, only white people were nominated. So that means that, you know, there were no Latinos. There were no Asians. There were, you know. It was probably a couple of Latinos in there that's passing, though. Yeah. You know. You know how that get down. Yeah, like my boy, my boy in um in Star Wars. Yeah, <laughs> they probably they probably surprised to know that he is born in um exactly. Guatemala. <laughs> exactly. Just don't tell nobody. Don't push that though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you think about the whole? Because of course, we always have to give our two cents. So the whole. Uh, Jada coming out and doing her little video, and then the backlash behind that, and all of that, like. As somebody who's been in the business for a while, like, were you just like, eh. Well, I mean, we have to also, we have to learn how to participate in the process. And also, we got to bet on ourselves. At the end of the day, yes, we have challenges, but it, this is not a business, business that's easy for anybody. When, you know, I mean, there was a time when Clint Eastwood was typecast. What Clint Eastwood did was he took his own money from the films in which he was typecast, and he made the films in the roles that he wanted to be presented in. To an extent, isn't he still typecast as the old racist man in every movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's the pearl he wants to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's, I mean, he directs and different things, and True. there were people that weren't going to give him that opportunity. So, like, for me, you know, you have to go back and nurture people and so like when you look at Forrest Whitaker like Ryan Coogler I mean I met the brother when he was in at the Cannes Film Festival and I saw when I saw his first short locks I was like oh my god like you are in like I, where he is now I had no doubt and I saw his six minute film and so that's what Oakland breeds man <laughs> look at you look at you he's very bay though so <laughs> so so the um so the thing is but Forrest Whitaker when he was presented with Ryan he he banked on him. 
And now he's launched a new person. Like, we are not launching enough talent. And that's kind of uncommon in Hollywood, too. Yeah. With us. Like, if we didn't have, if, if real talk, if we didn't have hip hop, we wouldn't have directors and stuff. We wouldn't have people who could step into these roles because a lot of, because people make music videos, like at the end of the day, F. Gary Gray was making music videos. Yeah. You know, all of, all of our, like when you go into the pool of white directors, you can, there are a whole lot of white directors who've never made a music video. Mm -hmm. But for us, if it wasn't for the music, we wouldn't have opportunity. Because we don't have that kind of system where people are bringing us up through the ranks. Although it's getting better, especially for directors, because television is so strong. Oh, yeah, TV is strong. TV strong right now. I I was binge watching Being Mary Jane the other day. (laughs) (laughs) That show is good. That show show is good as hell, bro. It's gotten better. It was, it was, um, that first season was. Rhonda is a more harsh critic than I am. (laughs) So, and I'll say that the first season was kind of extreme. It's like, yo, they. Oh, no, this season, it was some Emmy award winning work on this. Like, it was, they was doing. Yeah, I mean, you got to check it out. I will. I'm so late. I'm just watching 24, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm super late. I'm going to be calling y'all like 10 years from now like, hey, man, you was right. That being very Jane. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. But you've been binging on Netflix. You saw Narcos. I haven't seen Narcos. I haven't seen Making of a Murder. The last show I watched on Netflix was Masters of None, which I thought was pretty good. Oh, but I, I also these. don't pay <laughs> I noticed I'm a multitasker because my homegirl was in town and she was in an episode of Masters of None. I didn't even notice while oh, wow. I was watching it. <laughs> like, because I'm doing a bunch of stuff at the same I'm a listener. So it's like if some piece, I'm like, oh, let me pay attention. So, oh, you know what? Netflix, Netflix got like some like kind of mm-hmm. British wire on called Top Boy. I don't like British shows. <laughs> I haven't I haven't clicked on that one yet. I've been meaning to. I do. I cannot get. I love British movies. I can't get into the TV shows. They're too slow. <laughs> They're too slow. Yeah, the, the humor does. I don't like Luther. I tried to watch it a couple times. I was like, mm. it just couldn't even it save it for you. I mean, I'm not a woman, so. <laughs> <laughs> I like the interest in the wire. Other than that, I know Stringer like, Bell. Stringer yeah, Bell like, is everything. Stringer was the man, yeah, <laughs> most definitely. Um, oh, what I wanted to ask you also was, since, and we asked Lotto as well, because Rhonda's also in the sports a little bit, pro sports though. Yeah. No, no well, college. Not, well, I mean, I'm into college, like basketball. I'm not as really good in football. Gotcha. But I'm I'm East Midwest. So, you know. so who who you got in the Super Bowl? Oh. Cam, come on! Everybody man. loves Cam. Cam better no, not and, mess this up. It's funny that nobody's even saying. I like the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> yeah. oh, we, we team Cam over here, baby. Right? I, and I hate the Steelers couldn't get in. Yeah. So at least I can be like, mm, you want the coach From or you Chicago, want the Chicago, but a Steelers thing. Oh well, you know I like the Bears too. It's, I mean, that's mandatory. <laughs> but you, you know, know us from my, I don't understand that. I'm <laughs> well. I, I got Raiders, the, A's, Warriors, I got the Cal, Bears. I, I got the Eagles. I got the Steelers. Well, you know what's so deep? The Eagles because of Randall Cunningham oh, back in the day. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but also even with the Steelers when I was younger because my family is originally from Mississippi and my when the Cowboys and the Steelers used to go up against each other all the time, I was always for the Steelers. Hmm. And so later on, I found out. That the Steelers had like lots of black folks, you yeah. know, or like you know, like as you know, the singer Joy, you Joe know, her, yeah, yeah. Her pops. and then um, Bill Nunn, his dad was a scout for the Steelers. Yeah. So okay. like you know, so like when you find it, you're like, oh, and I like them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think, and another, I'm I'm rooting for Carolina as well, just on the record, because uh, Ron Rivera, man, that's the second oh. Latino co- uh, coach to ever coach in the Super Bowl, my and- Tom Flores. And then, Raiders. and then also, and then I mean, somebody on Facebook pointed that out. My my boy Alan Gordon, like yeah. you know, black pointed. cat. But the oh yeah, the Ebony cat, yeah. <laughs> cat, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, gee. so but the um, but also you got to look at the significance. Yes, we've had you know at this point, you know, we've had black quarterbacks in the Super Bowl before, but to have one representing a deep South team. Yeah, I mean, like Carolina's is, you know, and he is, and he I is very been, much caught. But you know too. what's crazy? 
people get put that you know that that card on on uh, Russell Wilson, but you know Russell Wilson's family has a lineage through HBCUs. Hmm. Yeah, and but I mean, he, but he and he, all of that. But and he plays for Seattle, though. He plays for shoot, Seattle is. <laughs> but I'm about saying, as black as he get <laughs> for the West. I mean, no, for that part. Period. Of it. First of all, there's no individual <laughs> professional sports blacker than Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> like, See, I have without a, a doubt. <laughs> so, I, have, I can't even speak on Seattle. It's one of the few cities I haven't been to. But Seattle, I do, no, Seattle is dope, but I feel you. It is definitely much different. And I think you, growing up in the Midwest, having roots in Mississippi, you understand that at a different level. Oh, yeah. Most definitely, man. So you got to tell us, though, I really want you, before you to go, give us three books that you think every black person or somebody interested in black culture should, well, other than your book. <laughs> well, in my book, no, in my book, one of the things that I have is like the 10, I have, I have 10 black classics. Mm-hmm. And it's just books that like from being educated, having experiences of having education in the Midwest, um, New York City, and in Mississippi, and so forth. So, like, for me, like, almost everywhere you're going to read the um, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, right. you know? Up from slavery, souls of black folk, miseducation of the Negro, Negro, you know, I have their eyes were watching God, because you should read it. Um, Native Son, which now I understand Native Son a little bit more. My personal favorites from Richard Wright are Black Boy and... Um, Oh, 12 Million Black Voices, I think it's called. It's so beautiful. And it's like done through the WPA and it talks about migration and stuff. And it's just like, I mean, it's the kind of writing that they don't expose from Richard Wright. And what a lot of people don't even know with Black Boy is they suppress the second half of it. Because they, like the narrative they pushed was when he was trying to get up out of Mississippi and go to the north to freedom. But he had another part. Because when he got to the north, which in this case was Chicago, um, and I'm not making that up, <laughs> he found that, you know, things were a little better, but they weren't a well, whole lot right better, there, yeah. you know. And Invisible Man, even though it's not a personal favorite of mine, you have, you know, like you're going to be exposed to it, you know. People and, used to look at me like an outcast and I'd be like, oh. I ain't really like that book, bro. Like, how do you not like Invisible Man? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, it's 600 pages long to me. But, yeah. you know, I mean, certain things. And then, of course, the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, Got to remember. My cousin now. actually reads that every year. Mm. <laughs> you know, and then I like Color Purple. But, see, what people don't understand, because we have the movie and we have the play, but they don't understand that Alice Walker, who is a native Georgian, she grew up in Eatonton. She grew up in the town that Joe Chandler Harris was from. Right. Right. So she grew up in the Uncle Remus stories and so forth, which were a bastardization of the authentic um, African folk tales, African American folk tales that her parents passed down to her. So a lot of what the color purple is is reclaiming that history. See, but because a lot of people that. don't read the book, you know, they don't, you know, know that. And then Beloved by Toni Morrison, and I mean, Beloved is a harder book for a lot of people to read. Yeah. But, like, one of the things that the ghost, so-called ghost, represents is the continuation of the African slave trade after it was supposed to be shut down. And so a lot of things in which her practices and ways seem alien is but alien but also familiar at the same time is a result of her actually being African. And so it triggers memories and people that they don't even know that they have. And also, you know, but it's still an unknown for them. Because by this time, you have a lot of people who have now been for, for fourth and fifth generation of in this country. So they don't have the kind of ties right, to the connection. continent as they right. Man, you see the stuff y'all get when y'all live? We don't only talk to rappers and <laughs> actors and stuff like that. We also bring brilliant guests in here that know our history, man. We really appreciate you coming through. Go to Amazon and buy this book if y'all don't have it. Buy it for the kids and your white coworker that like to play in your hair and all of that. <laughs> I know some people who've like said, "Oh, you sold a lot of books today." <laughs> I'm slipping it under people's doors. <laughs> hey, there you go. There you go, man. We appreciate y'all listening. Oh, and before we go, um, this Friday, Birmingham. This- 
uh, ABL, the last one of the year, correct? Yes, it is. Last one of the year, so make sure y'all go ahead and uh, RSVP for that. It should be dope. I think it's at the the, the minor league baseball park. So that's Regis be, Field. Yeah, that's going to be kind of crazy, man. That's a different look for them. And also, we got to give a big shout out to our brother, uh, Killer Mike, Usher, Crit. Uh, who else can? Polo, JD, the Don. Polo. Yeah. Uh, my man Damon, who puts the Cash Mob ATL together with supporting black businesses for going to Citizens Trust Bank and opening bank accounts. You guys can do that. Th- you can do it every day, but you can do it throughout the week. Post your pictures online with, you know, you ain't got to show your balance or nothing. Just show that you went through there and opened a, a savings account or a checking account. There are black owned banks across this country. We need to support those banks because I'm going to give you a little game. You support them banks, you go in, you're more likely to get a loan for them for your business or your home than you will go in and chase a Wells Fargo where them people don't really know you. Anyway, appreciate y'all listening. Make sure y'all go to iTunes, check us out, subscribe, rate, tell a friend, tell a friend. You're listening to Day One Radio, ABLradio.com. We'll see you next week.